Hi, this is Greg Kilstrom. Welcome to season three of the Agile World, where we discuss customer and employee experience, organizational and workforce transformation, and how business can adapt and continually improve in an Agile age. The Agile World podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed in this show, you can go to my website at theagile.world and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the host of the Agile World podcast. Today, we're going to talk about using AI with lean principles to achieve greater success. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Lamit Patel, SVP, Growth Together Labs, and best-selling author of Lean AI. Lamit, uh, welcome to the show. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Greg. Yeah, looking forward to it. And uh, why don't we start out by you telling a little bit about your background as uh, as well as where you currently are. Yeah. So, hi, everyone. My name's Lamit Patel. I'm the uh, currently the uh, Senior Vice President of Growth at Together Labs. Um, Together Labs is a... Uh, um, it's a, a metaverse, um, our, our most popular um, uh, gaming app is called MVU, IMVU, where uh, we have millions of users that create uh, um, virtual um, avatar identities and interact with, um, with uh, creating different friends from around the world and, and having shared experience, uh, virtual experiences. And um, where have been around, MV has been around for over 15 years, and it's um, one of the uh, the top three uh, grossing uh, social networking apps in, in the App Store. So definitely seen a lot of, uh, lot of growth there. And uh, I've been with that company for over five years. And prior to that, I've worked with a number of different startups for the last 20 years. And my role has always been around joining startups to really um, help figure out how uh, we can grow the business primarily in the area of uh, um, growing users and, and revenue. So it's all around user acquisition, retention, and monetization methods. So let's let's get started here talking about AI and lean principles and things like that. So for those listening who may not be 100% sure what we mean by the term lean, um, can you explain what that means as as well as how it might differ from agile or other um, maybe terms that are used uh, used interchangeably at, in some in some cases? Yeah, so lean um, is 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 a terminology that's gotten really popular, especially started off uh, primarily like a lot of startups use that. But the idea isn't really about sort of being cheap, but it's more around you know how. How do you um, sort of leverage your your time and resources as effectively as possible, and to try and get to the outcomes or the goals that that you're looking to achieve? And so, primarily, um, it's it's all around um, improving processes uh, and execution around um, the way you um, that you sort of manage your business. And uh, an example. Primarily, that uh, where where I focus a lot on lean is is in the in the realm of of marketing. So the idea is, you know, when you're running campaigns, um, when you are when you manage when you're optimizing um, results, uh, the, the idea is, you know, how, how can you get better, faster, and smarter around either leveraging uh, technology or or leveraging uh, people uh, as well as possible to try and get to the outcomes of helping helping the business grow as efficiently as possible. What helped you make the connection between artificial intelligence and lean? Yes, of me, uh, I've been um, a, a big proponent on looking into artificial intelligence um, for the past like five, six years. Uh, um, the reality is artificial intelligence has been integrated into a lot of different businesses and processes. And, you know, a lot of people may not real, realize it. I know it's spoken about more openly now, but a lot of these companies that, um, especially in marketing, uh, where, where people are spending um, advertising dollars with Google and Facebook, a lot, a, a lot of their platforms integrate AI 
in some way, shape, or fashion, because the idea there is to really help them to sort of um, leverage all of this data that they have on their users to really help advertisers to get better at being able to target the right users with the right message um, at the right time to really achieve the results that, that they're looking to get in terms of the uh, how they define success. And so for me, you know, uh, um, fortunately here, here, here at Together Labs, you know, one of the things that um, that that we were able to k- kind of do early on was to sort of figure out, you know, um, how can we sort of um, build or leverage a system of AI that could kind of sit between us and the way that we're sort of managing all of our uh, paid user acquisition budget with all of these different partners that have some form of AI that's built into their systems, which for the most part is self-serving because it kind of works for their benefit. And we wanted to try and sort of build a system that could kind of holistically um, look at how we could optimize our budget as efficiently as uh, as possible. And so the connection for us um, in in using AI was all or was was initially the use case around how can we optimize our, 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 our marketing budget as efficiently as possible to acquire users to retain users and to figure out the best way to monetize those users. That's great. Um, and you, you hinted on some of this and already, but you know, for other teams that are, that are integrating AI and, and lean principles, um, you mentioned some of the mar- marketing metrics maybe, but what, what type of metrics and KPIs are most helpful to determine if the integration is successful? That's a, that's a really good question, and that can differ for different businesses. But generally, what we have found in in uh, you know in terms of success metrics, and I think this would probably apply to most marketing teams, especially when you're like um, sp- spending money on acquiring customers. Uh, uh, some of the key metrics that we look at one is really the um, the cost to acquire a customer. How much does it cost to actually? Uh, uh, acquire a user what is the return on ad spend so how much money are you spending versus how much revenue are you generating from those efforts um, another one is um, if if for example you know you, you're not initially getting a paying customer then you can kind of look at what's what's the CPA which is the cost per action the action could be whether you're trying to drive a download or or, or drive a registration or lead, depending on the type of business, and 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 then the other one that that we look at, and I think you know, especially companies that that spend a lot of money on acquiring customers, is really kind of the payback period. So you know, for example, if, you know, if you if you spend in a um, hundred thousand dollars a month, how long does it take for you to recoup that money back once you bring um, um, paying customers in? And so. For the most part, those tend to be kind of the key metrics that that I've found. You know that a lot of like marketing, perform, especially performance marketing teams, look at when um, when they when, when they're sort of evaluating the success of different um, AI platforms. Just to follow up on that a little bit, what do you do? You get any objections other than maybe a cost, uh, you know, a budget type objection? Do you get any objections from? team members when you start talking about introducing AI or, or even lean principles, but I mean, you know, introducing AI into, into the mix or, um, you know, what, what are some of the, what are the, some of the, uh, I guess, barriers you, that, that you need to overcome in, in those cases? Yeah, there's always, um, so what I would say with anything new that, you know, that there's always um, misinformation out there that yeah. people hear about when it comes to artificial intelligence. But but generally, it's in the realm of either it's like too pricey or too expensive, or the other realm is really, how is this going to really impact my, my personal situation in terms of like my job yeah. and 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 so you know what I found is you know educating users is real yeah not not just um, by users what I mean is internal internally you know educating different team members and and really sort of trying try, trying to sort of build internal consensus around this is really important because ultimately for any 
artificial intelligence any way, shape, or form that you want to implement that, it really comes down to having, you know, people really believe in that, right? So it's important to try and get the people on board as well as try to make sure that you have the right setup and the integrations put in place. And a big part of that is 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 working with your data team to ensure that you have the right data being integrated into these different platforms so that they're able to leverage that data to to surface insights and, and take actions on it. But um, um, but but to answer your question, uh, generally what I've found is in terms of best practice, don't try to like you know uh, come up with recommendations of of, of 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 something that could be really complicated for companies to really understand. And so, if, in 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 the examples that I've used at you know at companies which have been really successful, especially in 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 the domain of marketing, it's all around the budget because everybody has a marketing budget, and ultimately, whether you're a CEO. Uh, or a head of marketing, or or even a marketing manager, you're kind of held in some way, shape, or form to to try and spend that money as diligently as possible. And and so using that as the simple use case to try and introduce artificial intelligence, I've, I've always found that it's generally been able to get a lot more consensus around that. And 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 the idea of how we've kind of introduced it. Is is ideally sort of start with one platform and 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 and, and sort of run simple A/B tests where we have the uh, the the artificial intelligence machine kind of you know running certain campaigns that we can kind of compare results to internally how we're managing those campaigns and 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 try to see how results are actually looking and 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 over time try to move more and more of the spend over into the artificial intelligent machine to try and manage it. Once you're able to see success and the results are able to hold up. And so generally that I would say in terms of, in terms of the time frame, once, once you start running those sort of um, um, those AB tests it usually takes probably um, a couple of months um, like two to three months where you can successfully prove out that this, the the AI is actually working a lot more efficiently and, and effectively than just having um, different team members trying to manage those campaigns. And then um, once you start moving more, more things over to AI, then the, the question that comes up is how do you evolve the roles and the responsibilities of the different team members so that instead of them doing a lot of spending a lot more time on the manual tasks and processes, their, their role evolves and, and you can provide more training where it's more around supporting the AI machine to ensure it's getting the right um, inputs and, and the right oversight so that it's really augmenting the team versus versus becoming a decision of the machine versus the team. So it's more of a how, how, how the team and the machine can work well together. Yeah, and, and I love that you're bringing that up as far as there there is always a human component to, well, to really any change or any any implementation of any new system or anything. But I feel like sometimes it's overlooked when we talk about AI because, you know, the, the thought is it's something that can be done autonomously or, or without, without much human support. But in reality, you need the buy-in of the people, as you were saying earlier, you need the buy-in of the people and the teams to get it going in the first place. And you need the long-term support of it to make it successful. So I'm, I'm glad you glad you brought that up. That's great. Definitely. And, and then one other thing that I would add to that is that it's, um, it's, it's also important to continue to sort of share the results of, of, of how the AI machine is doing. Um, at different companies, I know generally most companies have like all hand meetings, whether that's you know like once a month or, or or whatever the cadence is. But but the idea is is to continue to keep sharing the results and and being fully transparent, so that you know everyone in the company can 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 get access to knowing how this new technology is working and, and, and it sort of stops a lot of people sort of, you know, people that may not have access to knowing the results sort of coming up with different conclusions or, or different hypotheses around how this might be impacting the business. So continuing to, to keep sharing that success 
just gets more and more people comfortable and, 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 and starts winning over more and more support around the idea being, okay, if we did this in marketing, how could we maybe apply this to other functions or areas in, in the business as well? Well, let's, um, let's switch gears a little bit and, and talk about your book, uh, Lean AI. So I, I like that in the description, you, you talk about the uh, judicious use of AI and automation with lean principles. So you know, where, where would you say AI belongs and doesn't belong in, in the kind of work that you do? Yeah, and, and you know, um, so, so what motivated me to, to really write the book, Lean AI, um, it, it's actually part of the Lean Startup series from Eric Reese, which is obviously really popular and best-selling book. And Eric Reese is one of the co-founders at the company Together Labs, where I work today. And, um, you know, w- one of the things he was able to sort of um, see firsthand was how we were able to, you know, judicially use AI and automation, especially over the last five years in the business to really be able to scale up growth better, faster, and smarter. And it was really leveraging a lot of the same principles of of the Lean Startup, which is all around experimentation, around um, trying to, to, uh, to pretty much increase your velocity of learning and, and, to, and to be able to figure out um, how, to, how to use data and 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 use it in a way where we we are able to really figure out uh, who are the right customers to target on the right platforms at the right time and 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 be able to do that rinse and repeat process um, by just running you know uh, as many experiments as possible and and so what I would say the, the judicious use of AI and automation is really coming back to that core virtuous cycle of the um, velocity of learning and with AI and automation, it just enables you to, to be able to run tens and thousands of experiments a month versus running, um, you know, a, a couple of hundred at that best case scenario, depending on how big your team may be. And so that's what we were able to, to do. And we were able to like break out those experiments when it came to the marketing funnel on different channels, for example, um, like Facebook, Google, but we also spend money with a whole slew of other partners. And there we were able to sort of run experiments around different types of audiences, like who would be the right people to target. We were able to run um, um, thousands of experiments around different creative messages to really figure out what's the right message that really resonated with the different types of audiences we were targeted. And so it really came down to that whole area of personalization to really personalize our messages to the right users at the right time across different platforms. Because what we really figured out is that different messages and different audiences reacted differently based on different platforms. And, and to be able to manually sort of run these different campaigns would, was, was just a huge challenge. But having a machine to automate that process really enables to, to, to be able to run that at a huge scale. And then, you know, when, when we were able to bring these users into our platform, we were able to figure out pretty quickly based on the user behaviors and actions, like what would be the right personal experiences to give them during the onboarding experience to get them engaged into the product as quickly as possible. And, 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 and with better engagement, we were able to retain those users at a much better rate than we used to. And, and then with retention, we're able to really figure out what was the right ways to monetize those users. And as an example, at Together Labs, you know, we monetize users either where they um, make purchases for in-app purchases, where, where, where they're buying MVU credits to redeem against different virtual stuff, or through advertising where they can earn those credits. And so by, by using AI, we're able to identify you user behavior and actions to really figure out pretty quickly what would be the right way to monetize those users and give them those types of experiences and um, through through the different user journeys that we're able to create. And so long story short, the entire marketing funnel just got a lot more leaner and a lot more efficient just that just by the fact that we're able to use real time data to personalize different experiences for users. As far as the the lean part of, of lean AI, uh, do, do you agree that people sometimes get the wrong idea about whether it's agile or lean 
Um, and you mentioned a lot of people think of, of lean sometimes as just being cheap or, or something like that. But, um, you know, these are, these are actually more scientific methodical methods of, of, of doing things. How do you kind of overcome some of that when you're, when you're talking with people? Yeah. And, and I agree with you, you know, people tend to have like different, uh, like, um, biases to, to different terms. Um, what I, um, what I will say with lean, at least when it comes to startups, you know, most people that work in startups now are, you know, are pretty familiar with, with kind of lean principles and, and being agile reason being for the most part in startups, your, 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 your failure rate is over 95%, right? Like most companies that get funded, you know, and end up going out of business. And so if you want to sort of be that small minority that actually ends up becoming successful, you want to be open to adopting new, new thought processes and ideas. And that's where, you know, agile and lean is, is definitely adopted at a much, much higher, much higher, um, uh, velocity than probably in other established businesses where people have more tasks and processes and more, uh, more different ways in terms of how they want to sort of maintain where, where the growth level may be. And the truth is with, with, with lean and, 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 and agile, where I would say they, in, where, where they overlap is that, you know, being lean is really about being flexible, right? In terms of, you know, what's the right way to try and get to an outcome or, or an objective. And with, with agile, it, it's, it's the same thing. Cause, cause, cause you, it's like being like water where you need to sort of adopt to the environment of where you are. And, yeah. and, um, and w what I've found is, you know, a, a lot of those, at least with both those principles, and I've worked at a number of different startups, it's been ingrained into a sort of thought process and mindset right from the start when you join these companies that, you know, it's it's not about, you know, uh, trying to be too rigid because cause there's another word that comes into startups a lot, which is pivot, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. right. Like I've heard that one before, yeah. That's right. It's, 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 then then you got to be able to like adopt, and that's where agile is really important because pivot kind of, you know, uh, connects with, with, with being agile. So, yeah. you know, the, the truth is, you know, you know, if, if, if you truly believe in the data, then, then you kind of use that as your guide to really help you to figure out, you know, if you want to, you know, uh, how agile you need to be and, and where you need to pivot to, to try and figure things out. One last question before we wrap up here, I always, as a fellow author, I always like to ask, about the process of, of writing a book and, you know, what, what can you share about the process of writing and, you know, did, did you, did it help you to look at the subject matter differently? Did you learn anything new through the process or, you know, what, what would you do maybe differently if you, you know, work on a new book? Just uh, would love some, would love some thoughts from you. Yeah. So what I would say is writing a book is definitely, uh, you know, a, uh, a unique experience for me, you know, you know, a big part of writing the book was really just being disciplined in terms of trying to figure out in the day, um, like, like how much time I was going to allocate to writing that and, 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 and making sure that I was blocking that time out in my calendar, which for me, for the most part, I was writing, you know, a big part of the book in the evening. So between like 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. So I kind of, you know, started cutting back on on sleep to sacrifice for writing the book. Um, but I think, you know, just just creating a predictable environment where, where you would want to write in, in a predictable timeline. So so that becomes kind of a, a habit. I think that was important to me. But in terms of the subject matter, um, the other thing that I, um, it, you know, for for me, because I speak a lot at conferences, so I was able to socialize the idea around what I was writing about and and be able to get real time feedback. Because I was talking a lot about this content at conferences, and that really helped me to to really understand just just how much value there really was for people to really learn about this content and and how little of it was being adopted at that time. Because a lot of the a lot of the big successful companies that people know about, like Uber and um, Netflix and Amazon, I mean, I mean, I mean, these companies are adopting this every day. But 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 the majority of companies have 
at least at that time frame, were not adopting it to that same level. And so, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of exciting to know that there was that there definitely was a lot of demand to for people to learn about this type of content. And and then the other thing that I found, you know, in terms of writing a book, you know, I love. I started writing. I used to love writing before, um, and obviously, I you know I hadn't written for a while. But I started writing a lot of articles around this subject in white papers, and that really got me back into the habit of writing again. And you know, just putting articles out there, and and as you know, you know, especially nowadays, like when you when you post things on like you know social media like LinkedIn or or, or different like blogging platforms, you get a lot of feedback, and that really helped. You know, sort of shape the shape, help shape the content for the book in terms of like what would be the right content, the right article, the right articles sort of help sort of build the different chapters that I was um, ended up going into the book, yeah. and 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 then the other thing um, that I found that was really helpful was just reaching out to sort of kind of creating your own. Um, sort of um, set of folks that, that 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 you trust, and and sort of having them sort of look over the content and give you feedback. So it was able to evolve the content to ensure it wasn't just related to my experience, but it was actually relatable to a lot of other things that people um, in other companies were doing as well. And so from that standpoint, it really helped sort of validate the idea by by looking at it broader than just kind of through my lens and, and, and getting perspectives from other people. I like that. Know. Yeah, no, I, I love, I love hearing that. And I think um, I've done some of that after, you know, af after doing a couple books, I, I like, it's almost like an agile approach to writing a book because you're, you're kind of workshopping some ideas and evolving. And that's, that's great that you're getting feedback from all kinds of different sources and, and making something, you know, it's almost, um, you know, focus group tested, but, but in the real world. So I, I love that, love that way of thinking. Yeah. And, 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 and you're right. It really is an agile process because the truth is, you know, um, at least, you know, before you start a book, you want to, you want to come up with kind of like a book plan, so to speak, kind of like a business plan where you sort of outline different chapters and, and, and put high, high level bullets in terms of what you would want to write about in different chapters. But, but you know, once you start writing the book, at least for me, what I, what I realized was, you know, whatever I had for chapters, like one, two, 12 or whatever, initially my idea was I was going to do chapter one, then I was going to do chapter two. But, but, but once I started writing the book, eh, you know, what I realized was that that you don't necessarily need to be sequential in terms of right. how you approach it, and so I started, you know, depending on what, you know, depending on what you know what was going on at that time, in you know, in 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 my life at work, you know, there were certain areas of the book that I was more excited about writing about. So, you know, um, that's the other thing: being agile and not, and 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 sort of you know, sort of you know doing what works well for you versus trying to do it traditionally and, and, and sequentially. So I wrote, you know, the chapters in different orders at the end of the day. Yeah. And another thing that I used for me, uh, at the time I was, commu you know, I was commuting to work and my commute was, it, it's a pretty long commute. It took me like two hours based on traffic here in Silicon Valley to get to work each way. So I was spending yeah. roughly around four hours a day in the car. And so what I started doing in the car was 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 brainstorming ideas around the different chapters that I was going to write about um, that yeah. that day, and and I would just record in um, a lot of those ideas so that when I when I would get home at the end of the day, I would just transcribe a lot of the audio into text, so at least I had something to work with that That's that great. evening. It's it's helpful to know. I I didn't I haven't done the audio transcribing thing, but I I definitely. Um, I've, I've written things way out of order, just based on similar to what you're describing. It just, sometimes you just feel inspired to talk about a subject or something's going on that day. So that's, it's, it's good to know I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, uh, Lamed, uh, thanks so much for joining the show. Um, for those listening, what's the best way for them to keep up with you and what you're doing? Yeah. Best way to keep up with me, um, 
I would say um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So, you know, anybody who, who wants to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to connect. I'm always putting um, a lot of co good content out um, on there around startups, um, lean principles, AI, leadership. So basically, you can connect with me. It's it's basically my name, Lomit, L-R-M-I-T, uh, Patel, P-A-T-E-L. I also have a... Um, a blog where, where where I put a lot of content and, and that's that pretty much my name too. So it's lametpatel.com. So you know, um, connect with me on my blog or on on LinkedIn or or on Twitter as well. And and, and that's the best way to keep in touch. And and anybody, anybody has any questions, always feel free to reach out. I'm happy to uh, to provide any help or insights if, um, if if anybody has any questions where I can help. Wonderful. Well, again, I'd like to thank Lomit Patel, SVP of Growth at Together Labs and best-selling author of Lean AI for joining the show. Thanks for listening to The Agile World with Greg Kilstrom. See you next week. Thanks again for listening to The Agile World podcast brought to you by Tech Systems. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can learn more and get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, from my website at theagile.world.